If you take resveratrol, did you know that resveratrol works differently in your body depending on how much you take every day? If you're not careful with how much resveratrol you take, you may achieve a completely different benefit or result from the one that you intended. Listen, I couldn't believe it either until I saw it in my own eyes. And you may have heard about senescent cells, the new hot topic in the longevity community. What are senescent cells? Are they so dangerous for our longevity? For that, we'll hear Dr. David Sinclair and Dr. James Kirkland, whom, in my opinion, is the greatest expert on senescent cells. Then we will explore the impact of resveratrol in different doses on senescent cells. We're also going to cover physating and quercetin. What's the correct way to take them to kill senescent cells? And which dose current human studies are using as a senolytics? And responding to your requests, today I will share what I do personally with my resveratrol dose when and with my senolytics because of this investigation. This video is part of our investigation into resveratrol that started with this shocking discovery in Dr. David Sinclair's own study that showed that low resveratrol worked better for longevity than high resveratrol. It's been a complete shock to me as I've been taking one gram of resveratrol on alternate days for three years now. Since this discovery, I've gone over 200 studies on resveratrol and I'm here to tell you that this molecule is much more powerful and complex than I ever imagined. Let's continue with our investigation into the secrets of resveratrol right now. Welcome to the Wellness Messiah podcast. I'm your host, Rimon. If you missed the first episode on this channel, our goal is to figure out why longevity studies show that low-dose resveratrol works better for longevity than high-dose resveratrol. In our previous video, we discovered how resveratrol creates a perceived stress to the DNA. And we covered that in relation to cancer studies and doses of resveratrol. This helps us a lot to our investigation, as well as understanding the tiebreaker system inside of every cell in our bodies. Longevity or death. But besides cancer cells, there is another type of extremely dangerous cells that you might have heard of. These cells are the hottest topic in our longevity community. Senescent cells. These aging infecting cells are a real threat to your longevity. They can age your entire body, infecting other young cells with aging. A serious, serious problem. Now we are about to discover what resveratrol does to senescent cells in different doses. I'm sure that this is going to surprise you, since I was shocked when I discovered this. And this senescent cell piece is another huge piece in our investigation. And prove once and for all that resveratrol in different doses is a completely two different supplements. So what impact does resveratrol have in different doses on senescent cells? We cannot truly understand that until we understand what senescent cells are, what they do to our bodies, and what are we trying to do with them. Similar to cancer cells, senescent cells are renegade cells that hurt the republic of the healthy 30 trillion cells that are responsible for our health. Let's hear Dr. David Sinclair speaks about what senescent cells are. Senescent cells are zombie-like cells, the ones that accumulate over time in your body, probably because their epigenome gets screwed up. But what they do is they shut down, they stop dividing, and they start secreting inflammatory factors and also factors that cause cancer. Yeah, and so getting rid of those would be a, presumably a good thing. And well, that's it, what Fisid and Kersinin appear to do. They do uh, in the dish and in mice. Uh, and there are even some human studies now that show that killing off these senescent cells in the body can improve health and ultimately we think could extend lifespan. David Declare called senescent cells zombie cells. And he suggested that we need to kill them to live longer. I noticed that humans in general are obsessive with killing zombies. A lot of the video game industry is based on that exciting goal, and now it's also the supplement industry. Seriously, those senescent cells are simply regular cells that used to be healthy and functional. They stopped being useful, and now they are retired cells. To be more scientifically accurate, a senescent cell, it's a state, a state of healthy normal cell reaches as a result of reaching the end of the life cycle. Cells can become senescent due to age and also due to exposure to some chronic stress such as damage, radiation, mechanical pressure or even infection as a protection mechanism from cancer, locking the cell growth forever in case it will become cancerous later. And unlike cancer cells, and despite their belief in our longevity community, senescent cells do have useful purposes in our bodies. 
First, senescent cells play a role in wound healing. When you remove all senescent cells, wound healing slows down. Let's hear Dr. James Kirkland expand. It's been shown in some of the animal models where you clear uh, cells, some of which are senescent, but if you target um, P16 expressing cells and remove them, you delay wound healing. It's been shown that if, you know, by a group in California, that if you add back platelet drive growth factor, you restore wound healing. And it turns out that it's the senescent cells that don't have a SASP that produce that. So you do need them early on to help clear up the wound. You wouldn't want to give it right, the, these drugs right away. But in a chronic wound, they may help. Also, these cells have a role during pregnancy. Senescent cells produce factors in the last five days of pregnancy to drive the baby through the birth canal. And also, senescent cells can be important in cancer prevention and delaying cancer progression, producing toxins against cancer, and also call the immune system to check the area for other cancerous cells. Let's hear Dr. James Kirkland, in my opinion, the worst expert on senescent cells, explaining when senescent cells truly become a problem. The senescent cells are normally removed by the immune system, specifically by NK cells. Um, the belief is that this threshold phenomenon is due to the rate of spread of senescence exceeding the ability of the immune system to clear them. And then uh, once senescent cells begin to accumulate, they can poison the immune system and NK cells themselves can start to become senescent. So there's a threshold effect. What we're trying to do is get below that threshold. Uh, we find that if we get below the threshold, for example, even with drugs that don't cross the blood-brain barrier, we're able to have a reduction of senescent cells in the brain because the body's own immune system can start yeah. to take over. It's less poisoned by senescent cells and uh, there's less spread of senescence. So the problem is not senescent cells per se as much as their out-of-control accumulation when they reach a certain threshold. If they don't accumulate, the immune system can manage them, but lets them cross that threshold and they infect the immune system itself and the rest of the body with aging. They are aging infecting cells and become extremely dangerous, almost like cancer cells. They kind of stuck at the end of their life with no fertility or usefulness. And they also lost their ability on how to die. The immune system forgot about them. Their death button stopped working. So they are just hanging there producing bad communication that hurts the rest of the body. This is not good for your health. I believe this is an issue that Dr. David Sinclair referred to. They are not defective. They are a healthy process that can go awry. Therefore, our goal is not to kill senescent cells all the time, but simply preventing their accumulation. And a senolytic is an agent, either a supplement or a drug, that kills selectively senescent cells not healthy cells. Now, you might have heard that fisetine and quercetine are being studied as a senolytic agents. Resveratrol is from their plant polyphenol family. What does resveratrol do to senescent cells? It does different things at different doses. And instead of killing them, low-dose resveratrol does something different. This is fascinating. Let's see exactly what resveratrol does. This study from 2022, this study found, I'm quoting, the results show that low-dose resveratrol can induce autophagy of senescent macrophages, promotes cell viability and proliferation. It means that resveratrol keeps old cells young and prevents them from retiring and becoming sterile. This is fascinating. Resveratrol apparently is a very empathetic molecule. It has empathy to those old folks. Instead of killing them, it keeps them younger for much longer. Resveratrol rejuvenates senescent cells and their ability to be fertile again. And remember, fertility in biology means continuing the cell cycle. So with the help of resveratrol, these cells do not retire and they stay in the workforce and continue to have children. And this has to do with SIRT1, what Dr. David Sinclair has found. Let's see a study that speaks about the importance of SIRT1 with senescence. This paper from January 2022 says... The expression of SIRT1 is diminished with age, whereas its increased expression is sufficient to reduce cellular senescence and extend lifespan in many organisms. So this makes sense because we know that resveratrol accelerates SIRT1, and now we know that SIRT1 is active in cellular reproduction and rejuvenating senescent cells. 
Let's continue with more study to see how resveratrol affects senescent cells. This study from 2021 says resveratrol inhibits the progression of premature senescence, partially by regulating CERT1. CERT1 is what Dr. David Sinclair work evolved around. This study from 2022, quoting, CERT1 activator resveratrol has biphasic effect on cellular senescence. At low concentration, it prevents cellular senescence and suppresses CESPs. By activation of telomerase, it has been shown to inhibit cellular senescence of human bone marrow stromal stem cells. It means that resveratrol keeps these mature cells fertile for much longer. This is good for our longevity. And it would seem that one of the ways resveratrol does so is by helping them to increase the telomere's length. Telomeres are the life clocks of each cell. And it would seem that resveratrol increases the maximum number of times cells can divide before they become senescent cells. The human analogy here that instead of retiring at age 67, they could live up to age 90 and have more children. Even better, resveratrol prevents cells under stress from becoming senescent. Remember, cells can become senescent due to age and also due to exposure to some chronic stress. This study shows that. They took muscle cells, or specifically baby muscle cells, and exposed them to stress that usually leads to cells becoming senescent. This study from July 2018 called Resveratrol Protects Muscle Cells Against Palmitate-Induced Cellular Senescence and Insulin Resistance. They said, our results show that palmitate-induced cellular senescence in both myoblasts and myotube resveratrol protected muscle cells from palmitate-induced cellular senescence, apoptosis during differentiation, and insulin resistance ameliorating autophagic flux. Very fascinating, this study, besides showing protection against senescence, also confirms two previous conclusions we had from this investigation. Let's connect the dots from the two last videos. First, the study showed that resveratrol makes cells more resistant to dying, to apoptosis. This is the tiebreaker system we have seen in the previous video, where high dose did the opposite. And this study also confirmed that resveratrol helps to improve insulin. We spoke about it in the video that you see on the screen. And I also wanted you to see that a good science is repetitive, boring. Despite the fact that the mass media tries to tell us that the laws of nature change every week. They don't. The bottom line is this, low-dose resveratrol helps us to stay younger by targeting senescent cells and delay their aging. This helps to all longevity in a novel way. Then you may ask, what about the dose? What happens when we use high resveratrol instead of low resveratrol? Maybe the low dose of resveratrol increases their youthfulness, but maybe the high dose is going to kill them. Well, that's what I hope for when I research this. Let's see what happens. So here we are getting back to this January 2022 study where they compared low resveratrol with high resveratrol. So again, they said at low concentration, it was able to prevent cellular senescence. I'm quoting, however, at higher concentration, resveratrol acts as a pro-oxidant triggering growth arrest, meaning stop of growth and induction of senescence and or apoptotic death in multiple cell lines. So what we can see that the benefits disappear in and in fact, resveratrol does exact opposite thing. It induces senescence. This is another study from 2020 comparing low resveratrol and high resveratrol. I'm quoting, low dose resveratrol promoted self-renewal. Whereas high levels of concentration of resveratrol increased senescence rate and inhibited self-renewal. So with high dose resveratrol, you completely lose this longevity benefit and you achieve different target. So increasing the dose takes all the benefits of the low dose and change the purpose, the activity of resveratrol. And, and in fact, has a reverse activity. This is fascinating. To me, it makes sense. High resveratrol encourages senescence because it prevents the cells from dividing and preventing fertility. What works against cancer isn't so effective against senescent cells. And this could explain so many things we discovered so far. Why in Sinclair's study, when we went up from low dose to higher dose of resveratrol in both obese and everyday feeding groups, the mice lost the longevity benefits in high resveratrol. We don't prevent their cells from becoming old, senescent. 
We also have an insight about how this difference of action of resveratrol on senescent cells could explain conflict in studies in resveratrol because we can see how the dose can completely change the effect. So if you run the same study with different dose, you can achieve different conclusions. This could be very confusing for the scientific community unless they understand how resveratrol works. So this is extremely important if you're a scientist. Third insight that we have a further support for our tiebreaker theory from the previous video. Resveratrol creates perceived stress that speaks directly to our genes, to the DNA that makes the decisions. If the DNA sees a small amount, it will increase the longevity of the cell. But if it's too much, meaning high dose resveratrol, it will get rid of the cell either by apoptosis, cell death, or via induction into senescence state. High dose resveratrol could tell to the DNA there is too much stress suggesting cell damage and that cell could become cancerous. This communication can lock the cell into a senescent cell to make sure it won't become cancerous and this cell now begins to call the immune system to see if there are additional other cancer cells around by increasing inflammation. This locks the cell out of function and fertility, even if it's a young cell. That's not good for longevity in everyday use. Does it make sense to you? The fourth conclusion is that, unfortunately, resveratrol is not a very good candidate as a senolytic in high doses. Instead, it is a great candidate in low doses to keep cells away from becoming senescent in the first place. This is excellent for us because, as we have seen, senescent cells aren't a problem when in normal amounts. It's their accumulation, the threshold effect Dr. Kirkland had mentioned. In low-dose resveratrol, by extending the cell's life, it prevents too many cells from becoming senescent, which could prevent accumulation of many cells becoming senescent together. Does it make sense to you? So if resveratrol is not a good senolytic, do we have other molecules that can be good candidates? Luckily, if molecules come from the same family, they still can help us achieve different longevity targets, which leads me to the two molecules from resveratrol polyphenol family, fisetine and quercetine. Let's hear what Dr. David Sinclair says about them, and then we'll figure out how they work and which doses are tested for senolytic agents. Quercetin, uh, which is a molecule related to resveratrol, which is also uh, suppresses the activity of senescent cells. Um, and there's another one that I'm experimenting with uh, to have a look what happens. I, I know when something negatively affects me or positively and so I, I can do these experiments on myself so the the one that i'm testing out is physetin f-i-s-e-t-i-n n physetin we showed in 2003 and 2005 in two nature papers that it extends the lifespan of animals uh small animals worms and flies but nevertheless it's been now shown that it's senolytic it kills off the senescent cells in the body at least in mice probably in humans based on some human data Do you remember the analogy of the tiebreaker in our cells, in our bodies? How the amount of stress is the trigger death? But now we maybe could achieve that with a different target. This gives us a huge insight into how these supplements, fisetine, quercetine, and terastilbene may work. Maybe in low doses, they activate longevity genes that resveratrol doesn't. And maybe these polyphenols in high doses can target the senescent cells that resveratrol can target. And indeed, some data, for example, suggests that taking fisetine and quercetine in high doses for a short time targets senescent cells directly. I'm reading from this 2018 study. Acute or intermittent treatment of old mice with fisetine reduce senescence marker. When I say acute, they mean high dose for a short time, similar to high dose resveratrol and cancer. I'm continuing. Fisetine reduce senescence in subset of cells in urine and human adipose tissue, demonstrating cell type specificity. This suggests a different targeting of different renegade cells than high resveratrol. If this fisetin data is true in humans, besides resveratrol, maybe other polyphenols like fisetin can target other renegade cells, possibly in different ways from resveratrol, achieving a complementary effect. Combining high-dose fisetin and quercetin together was never tried. They only tested separately 
or with other drugs. And there was synergy in some cases with the drugs. So it is possible that these two natural molecules will create a synergetic effect. It's too early to know now. So please consult your doctor before you do anything else. Unfortunately, unlike resveratrol, thanks to Sinclair spurring interest in this molecule, we don't have nearly as much data as we have in resveratrol case. By the way, I haven't seen any data on low-dose fisetine, so I'm not actually sure how exactly it targets longevity, but I have a feeling it can target different longevity pathways than resveratrol. But from what I have seen, more studies are supposed to come in 2023 and 2024. And you will find in the future, in this channel, research video on those supplements, when enough data is available. Until that, the decision what to do with those supplements is yours. Whether fisetin kills senescent cells like this study showed or not, one thing is certain to me. Exactly like with resveratrol, different doses are going to work differently because they apply the stress tiebreaker like in resveratrol case, meaning the dose of those supplements matters to what you try to achieve when you take them. So if we want to target longevity pathways, maybe we need to choose low doses in everyday use. But if we want to take quercetin and fisetin to kill those senescent cells, maybe then we need to go up to one to two grams. Not understanding the doses of those supplements can create controversy too in the research world. If, for example, researchers will examine 100 milligrams of fisetin and observe no effect on senescent cells, you can throw that study out of the window. It doesn't mean anything. The Fazetin trials, and it's to test the, the efficacy of Synalytics. And there's a trial which is just beginning. It's going to be in uh, when it's fully rolled out in 129 nursing homes across the United States. It's funded by the NIH. And this will be for uh, patients who test positive or have tested positive for coronavirus who are nursing home residents. So in this ongoing study that Dr. Kirkland has mentioned, they are trying fisetin to kill senescent cells. This is because these cells, when accumulated, worsen our reaction to COVID-19. And the study, they are using 20 milligrams per kilo in human adults. This translates to 1.5 grams of fisetin per 70 kilo person, or 154 pounds. So what do I do with this information? The obvious implication is taking a dose that will delay a cells from becoming senescent, instead of causing healthy cells to become senescent. Based on this investigation in this channel, and you need to see it from the beginning to not judge this video alone, today I take 50 to 120 milligrams of resveratrol, and not every day, I take them 3 days off every week, and also 24 hours or more before exercise, as I'm going to show you in the next video. I have no doubt, this dose should work the best for longevity in healthy people. It doesn't apply to sick or ill people. Regarding dosage, weight matters more than age. If I were heavy, and I'm not, I would take 100 or 120 milligrams. If I'm 6 foot 7, I may go up to 130. If I'm a thin, small woman, I would take 50 milligrams. But I would not go to 200 milligrams. In my opinion, there is a risk of a reversal of this effect, like we have seen in the cancer studies and in this video about senescent cells. And I don't need resveratrol pushing cells to die or to make them senescent. The second practical implication has to do with senolytics. Well, more studies will come up in 2023 and 2024 on humans and senolytics. So in 2022, we lack data. That's the truth. My thinking now is I'm too young for this, I'm 35, thin, and it's unlikely that senescent cell accumulation will be an issue, especially that these cells play a role in good health, and my immune system is young enough to clear them. Let's hear Dr. Kirkland speaks about which people, at what age, benefit the most from targeting senescent cells. Uh, looks like there are situations, for example, in younger female animals where senolytics can actually do some harm. There's some uh, indication in some uh, studies of that. So I think, you know, mice generally, for example, uh, most mouse strains don't have much in the way of detectable senescent cells before 16 months of age. Why would you give senolytics at four months of age? They seem to be most effective uh, in the case of mice uh, that are naturally aging without, um, that are non-disease models, when you give them at 24, 27 months, that kind of age, when there's an accumulation of senescent cells. 
I spoke about my age, but obviously over the age of 60, these senescent cells begin to accumulate and cause problems. So my perspective will change when I'm going to be 55 or 60. If I do take Synolytics, it will be for a day once a year. The older I am, the more frequent I would take it. So maybe if I'm 70, of course, consulting with my doctor first, I would take it every quarter for one day. And I would take 20 milligrams per kilo of fisetine alone or with quercetin, exactly what they're testing now in human studies. And you only need four hours of exposure to kill them. Let's hear Dr. James Kirkland expands. So it just takes a brief exposure to senolytics if you take human tissue and put it in culture from obese versus lean individuals. Four hours or so exposure is enough to initiate the process of apoptosis, uh, which takes 18 hours to complete. So a very brief exposure is sufficient um, to senolytics is sufficient to initiate an irreversible death of senescent cells. So I'm pretty much skeptical about the idea of taking them from three to five days in healthy people. Unlike old or sick people, we have a proven overburdening of senescent cells. It's too early to know now, so please consult your doctor before you do anything else. Another note here is pregnant women should never take senolytics because of the role senescent cells play during pregnancy. Taking 500 milligrams of fisetine and quercetin every day, like what I've heard Dr. David Sinclair says that he's doing right now, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. If I were to take it every day and also try to achieve a synergy with low dose resveratrol, I would take it in low doses, around 30, 50 milligrams per day. And I would cycle it exactly like with low dose resveratrol. I wouldn't take it every single day. I would take time off of those supplements as well. And lastly, everything I said here is not personal recommendation. The whole purpose of these investigations, with all the videos that you may have seen, is not to tell you what to do, but to give you an insight and understanding so you can customize that into a lifelong habit of longevity, based on understanding, not because I said so. It's your body and your responsibility, and you also need the understanding to be motivated to keep the habit for a long, long life. Having said that, if you love this investigation, then it's not over. And today we covered resveratrol impact on senescent cells. You can find all the previous episodes in the description or in the pinned comment. For example, the previous episode had over 13,000 views just in the first four days. So don't miss it out. It's important to understand what we have seen today. In the next video, we will cover resveratrol timing, exercise, and whether to take time off it. At this point, I need your advice. Is this project too boring? Please tell me in the comments, I don't want to bore you to death, I want you to live longer. And I try to cover as virtual from every aspect. I want to make sure that it's interesting to you. And I must thank Dr. Davis DeClaire because if it wasn't for him, we would never have had this amount of data to analyze and think about. We don't have that privilege with other supplements in longevity, you should know that. So thank you, Dr. Sinclair, for that. And it's a great opportunity to say thank you so much and how grateful I am for everyone who contributes to my channel via Patreon. The trust you put in me, and with your help, and the energy boost that you give me, you keep me sharp to produce the best videos on this channel. And because of that, I want to do a special thing for you. I've prepared a special two-page document, The 10 Resveratrol Habits, where I included everything I changed, all the habits, after this investigation. That includes, of course, the specific resveratrol supplements, the brands that I'm taking. So until the next video, and don't forget to check the previous ones, stay healthy, stay young, and see you in the next video where we uncover the mind-blowing secrets of resveratrol and its polyphenol family.